So thank you for, for coming after this short lunch. Um, so we are very pleased to welcome Rachel Silverman Bonifield, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. Mathias de Atripon, who is a professor at ULB in Brussels. And uh, Chris Schneider, who is uh, in Toulouse, but <laughs> uh, online, uh, who is professor at Dartmouth College. Uh, so this roundtable is about uh, financing innovation for neglected disease. So we'll have uh, Rachel speaking first, making a short presentation, then uh, Chris and Mathias, and then we'll open for more discussion and questions. So Rachel. Excellent. Well, thank you uh, so much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I used to live in Toulouse, so it's a great pleasure to be back here for uh, a little bit of cassoulet and uh, some good wine um, and to, of course, see great colleagues here at the Toulouse School of Economics. So um, while we're pulling this up, just to say a little bit about myself and the angle I'm coming from here, um, probably unlike most of you, I am not an academic. Uh, I work for the Center for Global Development. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, independent think tank. And what we try to do is uh, pull together economic evidence uh, and multidisciplinary evidence and do this sort of policy translation of what does that actually imply for making pol uh, evidence-based policy, who needs to hear that, how do we convey it to them in a way that distills the key messages and the sort of important insights from economics in a way that's accessible, policy relevant for the issues we care about. And, um, you know, as the Center for Global Development implies, we do global development. So we look at global health and education and economic growth and climate and trade and any number of different issue areas. I primarily work on global health policy myself, hence why I'm here to die. Um, and so today I'm going to talk, uh, as the session title says, uh, this is about financing innovation for neglected diseases. And the, I mean, I think speaking to this audience, you probably know about pull and push financing, but I'm going to give a little bit of an overview about kind of how and why we need to finance uh, neglect diseases outside of normal market channels and why, in my view, um, pull is kind of... Um, dramatically and unforgivably underused as a tool in this space with a lot of problems as a result. But not always. There's always exceptions. So <laughs> um, the first kind of message I want to leave you with is that neglected R&D needs occur at all income levels. So when we say neglected diseases, people often think of the poorest countries. Um, but these are, they look different in different countries. So this is a graph from a uh, 2018 report we put out called uh, Tackling the Triple Transition. Uh, our TSE colleagues were very helpful inputs to that. And basically what this is doing is it's separating out low income countries on the left, lower middle income countries in the middle, and upper middle income countries on the right. We don't have upper income countries here, um, but I can tell you what they would look like if they were here. Um, and what this is saying is, okay, what is the total size of the market uh, for health products in any one of these countries? That's the number at the bottom. So in low income countries, it's 4.4 billion. That goes up an order of magnitude to lower middle income countries, 45 billion. And then um, upper middle income countries, uh, the number is smaller because it's just a smaller substample, but it actually is a much larger market here. So these are just, these are not the uh, universe of all countries. These are a sample uh, intended to show, demonstrate trends. And the important thing to note um, is that they look different in terms of who is actually paying for these health products. So in low income countries, uh, donors, that kind of dark gray color, have about half of the market uh, power. There is no real market outside of that. It is very, very small. That's not to say there's no buying and selling, but the absolute quantities of money are very small. And it is really overwhelmingly the external donors who are providing the financing for health products in these countries. But as you move up to lower middle income countries, which hopefully this clicker will allow me to do, Okay. Okay. Oh, examples of this would be malaria and, and leishmaniasis. So these are kind of diseases of the poorest of the poor. The countries that where the the burden are are very have very low ability and willingness to pay. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. Okay. As you move into lower middle income countries, however, you start to see um, things looking pretty different. So 
all of a sudden the donors do not play a very substantial role. Um, you still don't see much of a role of the government. That's the blue section. Instead, you see overwhelmingly the market is private sector. So the, the total demand, the total size of the market has increased by about an order of magnitude, but there's low or no pooling. The demand is very fragmented and kind of unreliable because it's being channeled through all these private distributors and small scale sales. Uh, you know, there's differential pricing to different segments of the market. Um, there's, you know, some people are trying to serve the uh, wealthiest and some people are trying to serve the poor, but it's very hard to characterize these markets overall because they are so fragmented. An example of this would be TB. Um, so TB, there's about uh, $4 billion a year of spending between therapeutics and uh, diagnostics. That's a pretty good size. But uh, outside of some centralized purchasing by the global fund, most of this is happening in the private market. So the demand is very, very uh, fragmented outside of that one large purchaser. And then as you move to upper and middle incomes and then to high middle income countries, um, you start to see a larger and larger role of the government. So this is for upper middle income countries, the government's about 40%. If you go to high income countries, that goes a lot higher, depending on what country you look at, but you know, all the way up to 90, 95%, probably about 80% overall. But there's still neglected diseases here. They're just different. Um, it is it is neglected diseases because of classic R&D market failures. So this would be um, uh, antimicrobial resistance, the market failures for new antibiotics and pandemic preparedness, for example. But the point is, you know, these look different at different income levels, but when we talk about neglected diseases, we're not just talking about diseases of the poor, but we are talking about those. So I probably am not educating anyone in this room when I say there's two basic financing approaches here. There's push funding. This is subsidizing inputs to the R&D process. So paying part or all of the costs for scientists, scientist salaries, laboratories, materials, clinical trials, and so on. Um, and in this case, it is the funder bearing the financial risk of failure. They are subsidizing the input costs. That money is a sunk cost at that point. Maybe the research and development will succeed. Maybe it won't. In either case, the funder has already paid the money. They have borne the risk for that, the financial risk for that failure. There's also pull financing. And pull financing increases the magnitude or um, of expected revenue and profit, I should say magnitude or reliability of expected revenue and profit, contingent on successfully developing the product. So this means that um, you know you you if you're a company and you're saying okay if I develop this product how much am I likely to get for it if I bring it to market? This is increasing that number, or it's saying well I'm a company I think there might be this amount but I'm not sure. It's saying okay we're gonna make sure it's that amount. Maybe it's not increasing it but we're gonna provide that guarantee that predictability that allows you to then take the risk. Um, in this case, it is the private sector actors, the companies or the investors in those companies that are bearing the financial risk of failure. Uh, the payer does not pay unless there is successful innovation. And the intent is to sort of mimic or kind of reconstruct a functional market where one otherwise would not exist. Now, you can al always, of course, make many mistakes when you try to do this, but that would be the uh, idea. Oh, no, oh dear. Okay, hold on one second. Ah, okay. Hello? Okay. So there's several different types of pull uh, financing. So what, there's first what I would call de facto pull financing. And this is what you see in standard markets, um, where essentially most private, uh, most research and development is conducted by private actors. They are driven by the promise of mon monopolistic pricing via patent exclusivity if and when they develop a successful innovation. They know that they will have that time-limited monopoly. They will be able to charge monopolistic uh, prices. And if those the revenue uh, is sufficiently large from that promise, they will invest upfront in the R&D and they will be willing to bear that risk. Um, you could say this is a second category. You could say this is a subcategory of the first one. Um, and this is the payer policy and repeat game. So this would be a payer, um, for example, um, the UK's National Health Service and their um, NICE, which is their uh, health technology assessment and price setting body. 
um, where the payers establish rules and reputations um, for rewarding innovation. So over time, doing this over and over again and creating kind of a track record of what you are willing to pay as a centralized payer, you are able to then convey to the market, okay, if you if you uh, produce this kind of innovation, you will be able to reap this kind of reward. Um, and maybe that's not super prescriptive in the sense of there might not be a specific target product profile, but there is a track record of, uh, say, rewarding an incremental disability adjusted life year at a certain price. Um, and then uh, the, the developers know that is likely to occur and they are respond to the incentives that are set by that. Um, then finally, there's what I would call pull mechanisms. So these are specific programs and instruments that are purpose built to incentivize specific types of innovation. And again, there's still lots of different categories here. There's advanced market commitments, prize mechanisms, market entry rewards, volume guarantees, subscription models, many others. Um, we'll hear more about advanced market commitments from Chris, who will go into those in great detail. But the idea is that this is not an ongoing process. This is sort of a standalone ind individual program designed to incentivize a very specifically narrowly uh, designed type of innovation. Now for neglected diseases, the status quo is that most funding is pushed. And this is in contrast to typical R&D for pharmaceuticals, which, where we have a de facto pull model driven by the promise of future sales during that period of patent exclusivity. Um, this encompasses grants, product development partnerships, and so forth. It is primarily funding from governments and philanthropies. Um, the U.S. alone spends about $135 billion per year. This is across all sectors. It's not just health, but on sort of push financing grants for various kinds of research and development. And it can be executed by any number of different actors. It can be universities, nonprofits, for-profit pharma companies, and so forth. But the point is that the funder is funding the inputs to the process. They are subsidizing directly the cost of research and development. So why is this a problem? Well, we see several different, you know, kind of challenges that we run headfirst into. The first is that it makes, it requires the funder, a government or a philanthropy, to pick winners. They're doing so under asymmetric information. They know less about the prospects of success, about how strong uh, a, a given implementer will be at actually creating the R&D than the kind of implementers who are applying for a grant. So they have a grant application process, they have a selection committee, but you know, at the end of the day, they don't really know. Um, it can be seen as an unjustified corporate subsidy, um, especially if it's going to a for-profit entity or a for-profit entity eventually commercializes the drug. Um, this is especially the case, as it often is, when the public sector is also expected to pay the market price for the end product. There's also the functional problem, which is that push can crowd out as well as complement private investment. So if one company wins the grant application, right, and they get grant subsidy, and another company also had a promising candidate, but they do not get a subsidy, does the second company want to continue pursuing this, knowing that the first company has this sort of subsidy line? It puts them at a competitive disadvantage, and it might get make them decide not to do so, even if they otherwise would have. Um, a second problem is that it distorts market incentives. For funders, there's the sunk cost fallacy. The funders are serving as co-investors in the development of a product or technology. And there is often this idea in their heads that we paid for this, we invested in it, so we might as well use it. Even if what ultimately comes out of this research and development process is not is low value or just inappropriate for the intended recipients. Um, for the recipients of the funding, the push funding is perceived as free. Um, and they might continue to use and pursue such funding and continue products, even if there's a very low probability of success, well after the point at which this would have been cut off if it was a private sector uh, entity bearing the costs of, of doing so. so. Uh, third is principal agent misalignment. So somebody is in charge of distributing these monies. And it is substituting the small cohort of funders who have the money and are spending it 
from a broader community of national payers in setting innovation priorities. And national payers are themselves agents of the people they are paying on behalf of, but at least in a perfect world, there is democratic accountability for um, you know, what those payers decide to do with their money. And that does not exist if it's say the Gates Foundation or the US government making decisions on behalf of poor people in Kenya. Um, and this may, as a result, generate products that are inappropriate or unaffordable for the intended beneficiaries who may nevertheless feel pressured to adopt them. Um, finally, there's access market entry and pricing issues. So first option is that market entry is managed by a nonprofit philanthropic entity. The prices in this case would usually be set at a low or affordable level unless the marginal cost of production is high. But there's no profit motive for market entry. And often these entities are not actually, they don't have the skill set to do market entry and commercialization at scale. They have limited experience, success, or incentives to do registration, distribution, and sales. And so you can see quite uh, slow market entry and penetration. Option two is that where you sort of um, give the kind of the rights to market entry and the sales revenue to a for profit partner. This offers you strong distribution and market entry capabilities and incentives, but your incentives might cut against access. So you want to set a profit maximizing prices, and you may not have any financial interest in entering uh, the poorest and smallest markets because there is a transaction cost of every market you are entering to register to set up distribution channels and so forth. And what all this ends up is what we have termed uh, the product pileup, where you have donor funded innovations, some of them never materialize, and some of them do, but nobody actually wants them, or can afford to pay for them, or some combination of the of all of the above. Um, and in all of this, of course, there are continued real research and development needs that are not being met. Um, so what I would suggest is that pull as an alternative push can solve many of these problems under the right circumstances. So when a product is incentivized through pull mechanism, it, it has a built in purchaser. This reduces the product pileup because everything that is developed already has the purchaser in mind. There's already a payer who has said, I am willing to pay for this. I am willing to be the market for this. And that does not exist with push financing. It simulates market incentives and should drive efficient allocation of investments and decision making. A lot of this is contingent on design decisions, though, which I think Chris will talk about at length. At some point in all of this, you need to design a target product profile, which says uh, describes the actual innovation you're looking to incentivize. And this is an opportunity for upstream collaboration and inclusive decision making and design. Um, it should reflect desirable, desirable characteristics of the product to make sure it's useful and viable among the target audiences. This shifts the risk of failure to the private sector and restores that kind of incentive to cut things off if they're not working and mitigate some of the risks from uh, the government picking winners. Now, of course, the government does literally pick a winner of whoever won the contest or, or so forth, but this is happening downstream once the results of R&D outcomes are already observable. Um, but that said, uh, pull mechanisms are not a panacea. There are situations in which they are not appropriate. Uh, foundational scientific research is one of them, um, where you have open-ended inquiries and exploration when th these sort of foundational knowledge is most valuable in the public uh, domain and open source, where different people can take it and run with it in different directions, um, and where a successful end result cannot be described or anticipated in advance. If you want to have a pull mechanism, you need to know what you're trying to pull. And if you cannot describe it in advance because things are too open-ended, you can't do it. Um, a second uh, time this is not appropriate is if there is no option for a credible pull mechanism. To have a pull mechanism, the commitment from payers needs to be credible. If it's not credible to the market, the market will not respond. And in some cases, uh, the prospective payers, for example, perhaps low and middle income country governments themselves, might not be credible. Maybe that's unfair, but that it would be how the market would perceive them if they were committing in advance. Um, and there's a third one I realized uh, that I um, um, that I was missing here. I don't know how I've forgotten what it is. Um, <laughs> Oh, yes. Um, the third one is when there is um, when the social welfare of the innovation 
is so high that there is differential risk appetite between the payer and the private sector, where essentially the benefits are so high that the public sector is willing to pay, to overpay dramatically, um, to pay many possible winners for the uh, outcome of getting one successful product. This would be sort of the COVID example, um, where you both want pull, maybe you want pull, but you also kind of want to spread your bets, you're willing to overpay. Um, in this case, it's not as cut and dry, sometimes you still want pull as part of that, um, but it is the justification to fund additional push in addition to the pull. So I'll stop there. And I think uh, Chris is going to talk more about AMCs. Yeah, thank you, Rachel. So that's very interesting. And we are going to continue with Chris, who is going to talk more about mechanisms. So Chris, you can share your screen. Okay. Um, so can yeah. you see? 15 minutes maximum, Chris. So if you can do less, that's better. Okay. Let's see if we can get the view here. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Can you can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, um, Rachel, thank you very much for, for setting this up. Uh, I'm going to be able to save a lot of time um, because she set this up so well. Um, <clears throat> So the, the basic idea um, here is the difficulty in incentivizing investment in, in uh, innovation. Uh, there are well-known issues with, with traditional mechanisms, um, profits, patents, and, and prizes. Um, patents, for example, um, you know, they, they give um, some monopoly power to the, to the winner. But um, you know, that leads to high prices later on, um, and, um, and there are only limited incentives. The social benefit for many of these innovations are higher than the um, what the firm is receiving from the profits, even if they're making monopoly profits. Um, prizes, you know, how do you know how big of a prize to set? And typically, they're sort of such low amounts anyway that they provide only hobbyist incentives. Um, the, the shortcomings of any of these uh, mechanisms become just all the more pronounced when you're thinking about neglected uh, diseases. Uh, and, and here I'm gonna be talking about products serving poor countries. Um, so there's um, you know, profits, well, there's low revenue potential in, in these markets because people just don't have the income available to, to pay. So their willingness and ability to pay is just very low. Um, so what happens in these cases is often donors will step in. Rachel showed the, um, the fractions there, especially in the lowest income countries. Um, so donors step in and do the procurement um, because, you know, for altruistic or whatever purposes, they step in. Well, the trouble there then is that, um, you know, a patent's not going to do very much if you're essentially engaging in bilateral bargaining with a, a monopoly buyer, um, maybe UNICEF or uh, the WHO or Gavi. Um, so just to take some examples in the vaccine market, you see cases where there'll be um, vaccines that are developed um, in rich countries and it'll take years and years and years, decades to um, to diffuse into poor countries in the case of rotavirus or hepatitis B. And also the, just the case that there um, we lack new products for diseases specifically of poor countries, um, malaria and uh, HIV. So um, actually the, the Center for Global Development was um, just a, a big um, for, um, with, with uh, a proponent and, and advocate here of this uh, mechanism called an advanced market commitment, which Rachel referred to, and I'll talk about in detail for the rest of this talk. Um, there, there's some actually Center for Global Development reports. There's this book by um, Michael Kramer and Rachel Glenister called Strong Medicine in 2004. And um, it basically laid out the idea behind these advanced market commitments and advocated their use for um, for incentivizing vaccines for neglected diseases. Um, I'll, I'll get into the, the details um, in a minute, but um, here are some of the uh, design features and advantages. So it's a policy that commits to providing a, a top-up subsidy um, on top of some regular payment. Um, and it's committed to potentially far in advance of investment and potentially success. Um, so that we're, we're thinking about the investments needed are, are going to be the research and development and maybe also capacity if you're thinking about, say, building the facilities that are going to produce 
these vaccines at scale. And if you know anything about vaccines, uh, vaccine capacity is quite expensive and, and complicated. So the um, advantage of committing to these subsidies far in advance is basically it's going to solve a holdup problem where the if it's going to be a unitary government or um, don't, NGO or, or other donor, that's going to be the counterparty at the end. You can imagine that when they sit down at the bargaining table to decide on the price, the buyer is going to say, well, I really have a limited budget. You know, Tell me how much it costs to produce and, and maybe I'll cover that. Well, if that's what the firm expects, the, the investing firm, they're not going to have very strong incentives to invest in the R&D and capacity, um, all of these, these fixed and sunk costs um, over and above any production cost. So committing in advance to a subsidy on top of, say, uh, uh, the production cost is, is a way to help avoid this holdup problem. Um, the, the subsidy is a top up to um, a tail price in a country co-payment. Um, so the tail price is this agreed upon price that the uh, the companies, the, the producers agree to um, as sort of an exchange for um, agreeing to receive the subsidy, they agree to keep the price low for some uh, fixed period after the subsidy fund runs out. Uh, and so the the advanced market commitment, first of all, during the actual subsidy period is already committing to buying usually a large amount. And this, this tail price keeps uh, constraint, keeps the prices low in the period afterwards. That's going to avoid some of the deadweight loss um, from high prices potentially and um, can lead to larger access. There's payments for results here. It's, it's a, a pull funding mechanism. That avoids uh, the problem that um, you've invested all this money um, as, as a government or a funder and, and you have no, you don't have the success. So it's kind of avoids a political economy problem. And it also, as, as Rachel said very well, avoids moral hazard and adverse selection problems. You avoid you know, fly by night entrance and you avoid um, entrance to kind of keep with a project, even if its pro prospects for success aren't, aren't very high. The, the co-payments, I'll get into this in a little bit, but the, the co-payments um, that say the market participants pay, um, you don't necessarily want them to be so high that say these are uh, co-payments that the health systems in, in poor countries have to kick in. Um, if, if they're very high, then that's going to limit access. But if they're, if they're um, moderate or, or reasonable, this does provide some kind of a market test. That's a market piece of this advanced market commitment. Um, so the end user is going to have to kick in some payment. They're going to think about the value to them. And if it's not sufficiently valuable, um, they're, they're going to avoid buying it. And so then the firm receives no reward there. So anticipating that, the firm is going to want to produce things that the end buyers want. And so this mitigates an incomplete contracts problem where it might be really hard to specify, even with a very um, well laid out uh, target product profile, everything that you want in, in this vaccine or whatever product we're talking about. Um, but it might be really hard to get all of those features right. Um, you might miss something. For example, it, you might have missed the fact that um, you'd like this vaccine, say, to um, be robust, to it not need a, a very uh, cold chain capacity or something that doesn't exist in um, low-income countries and makes it hard to distribute. Maybe you forgot to include that in the target product profile. Um, and so that would be an, an incomplete contracts problem. And, and the firm, having received an award either way, would go for the easiest solution and maybe one that um, wouldn't have thought about that. But if, if you care about selling it and distributing it in low-income countries where cold chain capacity isn't that widespread, you might think about the design of the vaccine. Chris, I have a clarification question. Sure. Um, if you can also speak very well in front of the microphone, uh, because sometimes we have difficulties listening to you. Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, I think my internet is going in and out yeah. too. But. When you talk about co-payment uh, as a, for the market test, uh, here you're talking about the co-payment of the poor country who is paying part of the uh, of the cost with respect to the donor who is giving it, uh, or you're not talking about something else. Right, and I'll get into that in this slide here. I'll get okay. into the, the details here. Um, so let me uh, just talk about... Um, an example from the uh, the pilot program, these advanced market commitments were, were piloted for the uh, second generation pneumococcal vaccines. And so some of these um, jargon terms that I've thrown out there, I can give some more concrete definition. Um, 
So uh, this program started with a pledge in 2007, um, five countries in the Gates Foundation pledged $1.5 billion for a uh, second generation pneumococcal vaccine. Um, there are a bunch of different diseases that were contending to be the ones, um, the strong medicine, I think the book I talked about anticipated this being run for malaria, but ultimately um, it was chosen um, to run for these pneumococcal vaccines. Um, now, pneumococcus might be less well known than malaria, but it actually uh, killed um, very many children, um, estimated to kill um, anywhere between 700,000 and a million children under five annually in low income countries. Um, we don't hear about it as much in high income countries because we have antibiotics that kind of cure this, but it, there's uh, in countries without as much access to antibiotics. Um, it would uh, kill children due to um, pneumonia and meningitis. Now, there were already first-generation vaccines um, that covered, they were designed to cover the strains that were um, prevalent in high-income countries. Um, there were uh, a number of other strains that caused a small percentage of cases in high-income countries, but there was enough inducement there that there's actually some research, and in fact, quite a bit of research. Two firms had um, these second-generation uh, vaccines that um, conjugated even more strains um, that kind of completed the coverage in, in rich countries. It just so happened that the strains that these covered were very prevalent in, in low-income countries. So these are going to be much more useful for low-income countries, these second-generation vaccines. So th there's already uh, research and development. There are two firms that were already in phase three trials well along. So what was this, you know, what incentives were needed? Here it was more to incentivize the completion of the R&D, but even more than that, to incentivize the capacity and the distribution um, for as close to a universal vaccination campaign as possible in low-income countries. So the target might have been something like 200 million uh, courses, I should say, in, in um, low-income countries. So in 2009, um, there was work uh, um, along with Michael Kramer and, and uh, John Levin, I'll talk, we co-authored some work on this, um, I'll get to in a sec. Um, we're part of, uh, we and, and um, a bunch of other economists were part of this, um, and also industry officials and, and, and medical people, part of this economic expert group that worked on validating and, and the, the framework design, and we actually did some work modifying it. The ultimate design um, talked about, actually, the, the bulk of the price was going to be paid by Gavi, this uh, $3.50 per dose. Um, and then there are these graduated country co-payments that Pierre was asking about. Um, so basically, this was part of the Gavi program. For any vaccines that Gavi um, provided, they have a, already a co-payment schedule. So the poorest countries pay nothing. Um, and then as a function of income, you might pay 10 cents or, or 20 cents or, um, say, low middle income countries might pay as much as a, a dollar. Um, and so Gavi would make up the rest of this this 350 and you could graduate too as, as the country's um, per capita income rose, you would graduate to higher co-payments. So the advanced market commitment actually only was um, the, the subsidy relative to that 350 was um, not huge. It was actually 75 cents according to the ultimate design. So one thing we um, worried about was, you know, whether this was actually going to provide the right incentives for um, the amount of capacity that was, was part of the target. Um, so um, we advocated that it uh, have this design feature where um, we called it a supply commitment, where you could only draw down the funds in proportion to the fraction of the, the target um, that you produced. So if you're only producing a, a small fraction of that, the, the total amount you could draw out of the fund was limited. In 2010, manufacturers responded. They actually did commit not to the full target but to uh, 30 million annual doses each, so a, a total of 60. Um, through 2020, most of the funds were spent. Um, the prices actually fell, so they were agreeing to lower uh, tail prices. Serum Institute came in. Um, and as we'll see in the next um, picture here, um, what you, some program evaluations that we did. I mean, in a sense, if you throw $1.5 billion at a problem, you expect to get something for it. In fact, much more money than that was thrown. If you think about the Gavi, contribution. When you add that in, it was something like more, the program spent five or six billion dollars in total. Um, so if you spend five or six billion dollars um, on a disease, you expect something for your money. 
Um, the, the question is, was the uh, design of the advanced market commitment uh, contributing to this success? So what we do in this, this figure is compare um, the uh, expansion of coverage relative to coverage in high-income countries for pneumococcal disease in blue compared to that for rotavirus, which has actually received similar support from Gavi, but wasn't structured as an advanced market commitment. And the graph shows that the rollout of pneumococcus was about five years faster. Um, so I'm I'm very low on time here. Um, in in the last few minutes, um, just wanted to talk a little bit about some theory work that Michael Kramer, um, John Lemon, and I did um, here, where um, basically we set up a model where this advanced market commitment, which is um, we model as just a, a fund that you commit to F, might be 1.5 billion dollars, and a per unit payment, say 75 cents, that's layered on top of there's already going to be bargaining that happens between um, a, a donor or uh, an agency like Gavi and, and these firms anyway. So we can't ignore that, that there's going to be this bargaining to, for supplies. So the, the advanced market commitment is layered over that. And one of the subtle issues here is that, you know, what, how does this really um, sweeten the pot? We, we think that you know, through this bargaining, they might just sort of, you know, it's like shifting money from one pocket to the other um, for the donor. And is that really going to make them, um, you know, maybe they'll just take that subsidy into account and actually provide less of a payment, um, um, less of a payment in the, in the bargaining. So just basically, um, it'll, there'll be crowd out there. And in fact, if you don't design it correctly, <laughs> that's, that's certainly a possibility. So it turns out if you're trying to incentivize capacity, um, the the shape of, of the contract matters and these design features matter. Um, and so some of this theory actually supported the recommendation um, that you're, you may not get um, good incentives from the framework design, but the supply commitment design that we suggested might've been better. Um, another issue is that this uh, is, and this is the last point I'll make, technological distance may matter. Um, so the um, pneumococcal, advanced market commitment was run for these, what you could call technologically close products. They were pretty far along in their R&D. Um, and so there, there was really just trying to incentivize capacity investment. Um, but you know that's not the only thing it could be used for. Malaria would have been another target. And um, it turns out that the, the design principles might be slightly different for incentivizing a distant product where you also have to incentivize research and, and development. Um, and of course, Research and development is expensive, and so that's going to require rich subsidies. But the the asymmetric information problem might be less for these very uh, technologically distant products, because the firms may have just as little uh, information about what it's going to cost to produce as the donor. Um, it's only later on where the firms will know very well what their um, production and capacity costs, but but governments um, governments won't. Um, and the other issue is that um, with a, a very technologically distant product. It's going to be really hard to uh, design a complete technological um, technical product profile. So having these country coal payments as a kill switch might help incentivize proper um, product design. And let me stop there. Thank, Thank you. Chris. Um, um, Matthias, Matthias is going to kind of introduce the discussion. Maybe have some. Uh, more thoughts, uh, Matthias, if you want to share your slides, you can, and you have to unmute. Matthias, can you hear us? Yes, uh, hello, hello. Yes. I'm going to find my slides. So, uh, Is it okay? Yeah, we see the reference, yes. Okay. Um, and so you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this invitation. Uh, my apologies for not being there uh, physically. Um, now, let me uh, make my presentation, which will be complementary to the very nice presentation by uh, Rachel and Chris, since I will focus on rare diseases in the EU. 
this is based on joint work with Alain Fischer and Michel Goldman, who are both medical doctors. Alain Fischer is one of the fathers of uh, gene therapies. He was a professor at Collège de France, and he was also appointed by President Macron as the uh, COVID uh, vaccination uh, person uh, in France. Uh, and Michel uh, founded our uh, institute uh, at ULB for interdisciplinary innovation in, in healthcare. Um, so what I will talk about uh, here is indeed, as I say, rare diseases. And uh, I will stress the fact that uh, high prices for uh, rare disease therapies uh, are becoming a big uh, policy headache. Uh, progress of science is great because it opens up uh, new uh, promising areas, but they can be very costly. Uh, and so we'll discuss this a bit. And so we will try and make two points uh, in terms of trying to uh, kind of uh, limit the problem. First, we will argue that it uh, is worth considering asking pharma companies to set up uh, benefit corporation divisions for their uh, rare disease uh, business, uh, tasked to pursue reasonable prices for their innovation therapies. Uh, that's point number one. And point number two, based on uh, what happened in the, in the COVID-19, uh, to uh, suggest that the EU could play a, a more active role uh, in terms of the purchase and the organization of the rare disease therapies market. So first of all, a couple of uh, points from uh, the uh, medical area. Uh, here are a couple of uh, uh, examples of uh, rare disease therapies and uh, some uh, market prices so for one injection uh, which can cure you uh, still but uh, it's it can go uh, up to 2.8 million uh, uh, dollars now you can say these are very rare uh, rare uh, diseases so maybe a lot of money times a very low number that's still okay uh, but when you look at uh, what people say in the area and for example there is this paper by uh, Hans-Georg Eichler and co-authors, and Hans-Georg was the chief medical officer of the European Medicines Agency, so a very well-respected person. Uh, in that paper, well, he stresses that, uh, well, rare diseases affect uh, in total around 6% of the EU population. They are currently a profitable business for industry. 50% of new marketing authorization in the EU are about uh, rare diseases. So this is not antibiotics or vaccines or treatment for poor countries. Uh, there is a lot of action. On the other hand, although patient population for each disease is very small, costs already add up. In fact, in Austria, for example, which is the, the country of Hans-Georg Eichler, but a very similar country from, uh, from ours, uh, already 8% of the, the drug budget is for rare diseases. And we are talking about an area where 90% of rare diseases still have no treatment. So we are talking about treatment for 10% of 6% of the people, so 0.6% of the population, and we are already at 8% of the drug budget. So uh, now among the things that in a medical area they mention are uh, transparency on costs, uh, sharing uh, information across rare diseases to help platforms, so synergies. Uh, the EU uh, Commission is uh, worried about this. They've come up with an improved affordability strategy, uh, enhancing competition, uh, working with national authorities to exchange information, uh, and uh, indeed do synergies, enhancing transparency, and this kind of thing. All these things that we economists understand. Uh, our feeling is that um, it might be helpful to get the private sector to help. And by private sector, I mean, um, you know, I don't like uh, to criticize big pharma because, you know, big pharma, you have uh, lots of people there working for the common good inside these companies. Uh, the problem is more the fact that, as we know, all over the economy for the last decades, uh, shareholder primacy, shareholder value, has become really dominant. It was, for example, already documented very well, for example, in this paper by Bank Holmstrom and Steve Kaplan. Uh, and in fact, uh, I think it's particularly important in some sectors where they earn a lot of money, 
Uh, there is a paper by uh, Andrew Lowe and some co-authors, uh, Thakur and others. So Andrew Lowe is a pretty well-established finance professor at MIT. And uh, he documents that uh, the uh, while biotech firms don't beat the market, big pharma companies beat the market in uh, risk-adjusted return by 3% every year. Now, Pfizer markets, uh, market cap is two, 200 billion, 3% of that is 6 billion. And uh, so basically, uh, I think it would make sense given that public budgets uh, are, uh, are not uh, unending uh, with aging, with, uh, with uh, the cost of climate change, all these kinds of things. Our feeling is that it would be good to uh, ask indeed uh, some pharma companies to have uh, uh, either to put common good advocates on the board of these companies, uh, like people like Bill Gates saying, look, you know, profit is one thing, but what about the common good? Uh, and, and I think also to turn uh, some divisions into benefit corporations. So uh, the idea would be to say, look, let's go for reasonable prices. So let us avoid losses, but let's not generate excess risk adjusted rates of return. And the advantage of this kind of legal structure is that it would protect top management from being sued by shareholders from, for deviating from pure shareholder value maximization. Now, so that's one idea. Uh, by the way, there are additional things. This 3% a year is worsened by the fact that, uh, of course, uh, the regulation is not perfect. Uh, and of course, as I say, if uh, shareholders run the companies, they will try and take advantage of loopholes. Uh, another paper by Andrew Lowe and some other co-authors is that, for example, in the U.S., uh, marginal innovation is much more, uh, much more uh, uh, profitable than uh, truly creative innovation. Uh, they do that in a very nice study about uh, cancer therapies. So, in fact, by uh, making uh, uh, regulation uh, smarter in terms of, indeed, for example, uh, avoiding these kinds of biases, you can kill two birds with one stone in the sense that uh, you, uh, you uh, by reducing the kind of uh, the, the excess profitability of this marginal innovation, you immediately uh, induce more uh, truly creative innovation. But, uh, but anyway, the, that's the first point. The, the second point, lessons from COVID-19. Now, and I saw that Rachel had a paper uh, suggesting that uh, we should uh, build on the successes of the Operation Warp Speed in order to, uh, to have more uh, innovation in, uh, in a number of these areas. Uh, I think it is quite clear that although the Trump administration didn't do everything right, as we know, on COVID management, uh, they, uh, with BARDA, their biomedical uh, uh, advanced research and development authority, uh, and their Operation World Speed, they managed to, uh, to really push uh, uh, innovation in, in COVID vaccines. Let me stress the fact, and I think it's also helpful on this uh, debate about push and pull and all these kind of things. Um, I think it's a very, very good example of a smart uh, um, industrial policy. So, and by smart industrial policy, I would argue that it's uh, not just picking winners, but uh, picking a set of potential winners and making sure that there is enough uh, competition among them. So basically they concentrated funding on six projects. Uh, and it's impressive to see that these six projects were three different technologies, mRNA, viral vector, protein subunit with dual sourcing each time. Of course, there is a famous uh, Bio BioNTech, Pfizer and Moderna uh, for mRNA, but also uh, Johnson & Johnson and Oxford AstraZeneca for viral vector and, and all that. So uh, they, uh, they also decided to go worldwide, not just US. Uh, by the way, BioNTech Pfizer, they gave the money to BioNTech, the German biotech companies, not to, not to Pfizer that came later. So uh, in the end, all six have been authorized in the EU. So they were all successful, five in the, in the US. So it was a very big success. 
is also a very big contrast with the identity of the top four vaccine product producers in the world pre-COVID-19 in the West, which were GSK, Sanofi, that teamed up for one, but uh, probably the least uh, successful of the six, uh, Merck, Sharp and Dome, and Pfizer. And as I say, Pfizer only came later. So uh, I think uh, it's a good uh, good lesson for uh, for smart um, smart industrial policy. Uh, and the mRNA technology was basically developed by biotech by biotech companies. And uh, indeed, BioNTech then took advantage of Pfizer. Moderna, by the way, they did for them by themselves. So uh, in that sense, let us keep in mind uh, not to exclude. Also, when you go for these pull factors, uh, do include the uh, promising uh, smaller firms. Now then, uh, coming back to uh, after the innovation, the purchasing, uh, Israel showed that you don't have to be involved in R&D or production to get ahead. Uh, they paid a high price and they were the first. Uh, by the way, they also uh, uh, allowed uh, Pfizer BioNTech to, to look at the impact of vaccination on Israeli population as a whole, thereby contributing to, to global knowledge. UK and US benefited from close link to AstraZeneca and Pfizer and Moderna, respectively. The EU, they had an interesting, uh, interesting strategy. At the beginning in the EU, four countries wanted to go by themselves and buy these vaccines. So Germany, France, Italy, and the Netherlands. So it took a while for the EU to say, look, uh, let's try and do it all together. So uh, that led to some delay. Uh, if you look at this, uh, the vaccination starting uh, December 2020. We still have 20 minutes for questions and answers, or maybe if you can. Okay, okay. So let me yeah. just uh, three, four minutes and, I, and I'm done. So, uh, so Israel was first, then the UK, then the US, then the EU. However, the EU did manage to uh, make sure uh, this is vaccination across the, the 20 uh, top uh, EU countries by, by population. Okay, you have, uh, you have uh, Hungary that went a bit faster because they went uh, Sputnik uh, with the Russians and then two, two, three countries were later. But in fact, as you see, it was very, very concentrated up to the point where you started reaching the, uh, the vaccine hesitancy. So, uh, the, uh, in fact, the EU did manage to ensure uh, a pretty um, equal uh, access at a pretty low prices. By the way, these prices are supposed to be secret, but the Belgian Secretary of State tweeted about them. So, uh, the, and so the, the point is in the end, I think that uh, this has quite uh, interesting lessons for, for rare diseases. We know the prices are a problem. In this sense, coordinating the bargaining at the EU level of purchases for rare diseases where lower prices is an overriding objective, the urgency is not as crucial as with COVID vaccine, would be important. By the way, it would build on alliances between member states that are trying to do the same already. The Benelux and Austria and uh, Ireland, for example, are doing one and so on. So our feeling is that uh, the advantage of these kinds of things uh, would be important in terms of uh, limiting uh, the, the, the high prices. And uh, we could also have EU-wide coordination in the organization of clinical trials, in terms of coordination of uh, uh, national R&D funding, uh, maybe following the NIH model in the US. So I think that there are a lot of potential uh, areas where the EU could play a much bigger role and is playing together. And that would really improve this trade-off between uh, innovation and uh, access. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you for all, all of uh, you for this very rich uh, discussion. So I think we have a bit more than 15 minutes. So I'm gonna open for question, I'm sure there will be a lot. Uh, so raise your hand if you want to uh, ask a question and uh, I will have some provocative questions at the end maybe.
Hello, thank you all very much for, for these presentations. Uh, my question is around the uh, Rachel Silverman's first presentation on the idea of a product pileup, which is quite a provocative idea, which I, I think you coined in, in, in a brief I read, but it hasn't been, um, shall we say, there's not consensus that that's the case in literature. And the, the evidence provided is is is, is bidacquiline and the, the slow diffusion of new chemical entities in low income countries. So I guess my questions are twofold. One, um, how did you arrive at making this argument that this exists? And I know there's really limited data, but how much you go about improving it? And second, how do you divorce? I, I think that the framing that was given, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, was that the products that are being developed were not the ones that were wanted. And I, I spent tears of my life working on bedaculine introduction. That drug was very, very much wanted. It was just completely unaffordable. And so separating you know, innovation for kinds of drugs we want versus kinds of drugs that we want that we can afford are two very, very different things. And so if we're arguing for a relative emphasis on pull versus push mechanisms, we also have to think about whether push or pull um, entry points would allow us greater possibility and, and, and leverage to, to insert those kinds of access provisos. And I'm, I'm not persuaded that pull versus push would, would, would get that entry. So thank you very much. Can I respond to that? Yeah, so I, I was not thinking of bedacolin as the uh, case study of that. So the two uh, sort of I, ones I have in mind when I make that point, and I, I do think there are others, but the two I have in mind are RTSS, uh, the first malaria vaccine that had something like a 30 to 40% uh, efficacy rate that required four doses and, you know, very marginal about whether this was a sort of good use of funds and a lot of pressure from donors for countries to adopt it. Now, ultimately, it looks like we now have a much better malaria vaccine, so it looks like that has been preempted by events. Um, but that was one. Number two um, are the um, self-injecting contraceptives, um, which was a sort of Gates Foundation funded consortium. Um, this was based on evidence that there was in theory, some demand from women for such a, a product. Um, so it wasn't completely out of left field, but there was no market demand for it because there, they did not have sort of country buy-in, country purchaser buy-in, uh, but private distributors. And so then they realized there was no demand and they tried to uh, have a volume guarantee around it after the fact. So those were the two the sort of iconic examples I'm thinking of. I agree bedacolin is a different case completely, and that is an affordability question. And I think this gets to the broader problems of the space of, I think everyone feels burned on that. Uh, you know, countries feel burned that they can't afford it. And uh, the developer feels burned that they can't recoup their money uh, from having invested in it and doesn't want to be in TB anymore. So, uh, but I do agree with you. I don't think bedacolin is an example of the phenomenon. Uh, I mean, I can talk there. You got a lot of other points too, which I don't want to take all the time, but I can talk to you about offline. Any other question? Angie? All right. So I'm Angie Aquatella, incoming at TSC. And this is a question for Chris. So um, there seems to be quite a bit of um, risk preference heterogeneity around contracting perhaps like a rare disease. And given your work with Michael Kramer that looks at heterogeneity, like mainly that vaccines versus uh, treatment paper, um, how do you think uh, risk preference heterogeneity um, guides us on the optimal mechanism for incentivizing innovation in these types of markets, like in, in the market for rare disease? Um, yeah, so I, I guess we should kick that over to Matthias because he was more about the the rare diseases, and, and I was thinking more of, um, you know, using these advanced market commitments um, for, um, for in this case, you know, we're thinking about malaria, we're thinking about pneumococcus. These are endemic diseases of uh, low-income countries. Um, so they're actually quite widespread. Um, and so you might end up se selling, um, or at least you want access to, you know, large swaths of the population to these, to these medicines. Um, I think different cases could be made for, um, you know, different mechanisms might be called for when you have, um, you know, rare diseases here. If if you have a, you know, a per unit subsidy of of 75 cents or a dollar, you can make it a hundred dollars. You know, that's not going to add up to much if it's, if it's uh, being, um, you know, um, if it's being rolled out to just a very, very, you know, um, 6% of the virus, actually, you know, one one hundredth of the percent of the population. 
Um, there, I think you need a, a mixture of different mechanisms. I mean, Matias had a, quite a complicated structure where you actually get into the corporate governance, um, whether you integrate that with, with push um, and you integrate that with, um, you know, other, other sorts, like maybe a subscription model or something or, or fixed payments. Um, but you talked about this, this heterogeneity issue, which is um, this issue about if, if you're selling things on private markets, and and there's a you know a, a wide diversity and willingness and ability to pay. Um, you know you might have some some really high demand people with a uh, maybe a high risk of contracting the disease, um, and and you have also other people that maybe the large proportion of the population has a um, a very low risk of contracting the disease. Although it might actually contribute a lot to demand in the end because that might be the the vast majority of the population. Um, so there, that just any, any kind of pr product, whether it's a vaccine or um, a, a medicine or, or anything where you have this um, very uh, asymmetric risk uh, or demand distribution, it's going to be really hard to price the product to um, make it lucrative for producers. So there, um, one, one um, point to make there is just if you have a, a market where you have a lot of heterogeneity in, in risk or in willingness to pay, whatever the source of that, um, that might be an argument for government support in those uh, particular cases. Uh, I don't think it's it necessarily has, it, it, when you're talking about um, diseases of low income countries, when you have donors that are buying these products on behalf of the population or, um, or the country health ministries, um, in a sense they can buy in bulk for the for the country, and so they can kind of integrate over the risk distribution. So it, it may not be that much of a concern. Thank you, Chris. Other questions? Yeah, Isabella. Hi, thank you so much. I'm Isabella Yelovats from uh, Gate in Lyon. Uh, so I don't know how important is the phenomenon I'm talking about, but some innovations start in uh, startups so many times involving universities the public sector etc so i was wondering whether the mechanisms you are talking about the uh, advanced market commitment or the benefit corporation can tackle this uh, uh, presence of uh, startups whose innovation in the end are both or acquired by uh, big pharma so i don't know whether i'm clear or not but about this in interaction between the startups and big pharma and how you use the mechanisms uh, to tackle this interaction. So, so let me just say one word and then I think it's more a question for Matthias, but uh, in a sense, these advanced market commitments um, are designed to be firm agnostic. Um, that's one of the advantages. Rachel talked about some of the disadvantages of, of push. They have to identify which um, developers, you're going to push through the development pipeline with some of these pull funding mechanisms and advanced market commitments. It's firm agnostic, so you offer the the um, price inducement or the contract at the end, and whatever firms um, you know come through at the end, there they can be um, you know the the uh, client firm. So, in in a sense, the advanced market commitment is is sort of agnostic as to the the structure of the firm. They they, they can kind of license things and and work things out for themselves. Thank you, Chris. So I think we have a question by Marc Lemonnier. Yes. Um, hello. Yes, it's um, I'm here. Yeah, Marc Lemonnier is from the CEO of a biotech company. So just um, yeah, you know, <laughs> answering your question, uh, I'm a, um, a company developing novel antibacterials to addressing the problem uh, the problem on antimicrobial resistance with us, which I think is very relevant to this discussion. And so, as a private company, uh, the model of companies like ours is at some point when you you show proof of concept of your product in the clinic, then big pharma comes and you know licenses in or, or or acquires the company. So that's the exit. The private investors that we have today um, are completely lost. And um, I mean, the uh, an investor can manage risk, but what they cannot manage right now is the fact that the market is unsustainable and unpredictable. So market entry rewards or any kind of pool incentives that we can discuss today, they provide to those investors a credible-ish, but at least predictable stream of revenue. And now they can do the models. And if on top of that, pharma starts making deals with biotechs, 
then the, the private capital will flow uh, again into our companies. But we need that because it's, it's, a, it's like a domino, you see, <laughs> the effect. And then just another comment on, on something that uh, I think Chris was discussing. Uh, I agree that truly breakthrough innovation needs to be uh, uh, incentivized more that, than incremental innovation. But let's not forget that some of the best drugs, uh, at least in the antibacterial space, uh, were actually incremental innovations. So, for example, third or fourth generation cephalosporins are excellent antibiotics, and these were, you know, incremental innovation based on a, on a, on, a, on a breakthrough drug initially. So, let, I think patient benefit and societal benefit should drive the investment more than is it really breakthrough, you know, nature nature science, and uh, or, or or is it just smart chemistry? You know, thank you. Thank you, Mark. We have time for more questions. Yeah, Luca. Um, if I may uh, address some, some of the oh, questions. Yes, Matthias, if you want to answer some, to say something, you can. Yes, yes. So, so thank you. Um, no, I think coming back to this, uh, you know, biotech versus pharma, I, I think the, the, the paper I was mentioning by uh, Andrew Lowe, Thakur, and all that uh, indicates that the, uh, the excessive rents or the uh, uh, you know, uh, above competitive rents are indeed uh, in the big pharma and uh, not in the in the biotech. So this is where uh, the the extra money uh, is. Uh, and as for the, um, I mean, I fully agree that in in fact that uh, what counts is indeed the, the quality uh, of the of the drug, not how innovative it is uh, per se. Uh, this being said, I think that this uh, this other paper I was referring to by Andrew Lowe, uh, Fojo, and others, they do a very clever study of uh, cancer drugs, and they look at uh, you know the, the Food and Drug Administration. They have a um, they first of all they they think about uh, the efficacy of a drug in terms of how much it can prolong life. And uh, they, for the uh, the promising ones, they give them a, a fast track treatment, and so they they compare the the return of fast track and non fast track, and it turned out that the non fast track is much more uh, profitable than the fast track, which uh, is uh, is unfortunate because indeed uh, that means that uh, too much of the activity is guided because of profit reason towards the, the less ambitious uh, less ambitious drugs. So in that sense, uh, by basically reducing the attractiveness of the non-fast track, you can rerun the money towards uh, more, uh, more promising avenues. So in that sense, you kill two birds with one stone. Thank you. Matthias, maybe a short question on this. Do, do you remember if the abnormal positive return of the big pharma are compensated by the abnormal negative return of uh, the biotech? Um, good question. It's a transfer, you know, from some small firms to big firms. Um, I think that, well, there may be part of that. Uh, of course, there is all the, the other, just, I mean, the, I mean, some biotech companies are, of course, extremely successful, but the reason why they don't beat the market is because uh, it is so risky. So most of the problem is uh, not the stuff that is about uh, cheap <laughs> by big pharma, it's the stuff that goes nowhere. Okay. Luca? Yeah, uh, this is Luca Maini from Harvard Medical School. You talked about these two pronged problems on the one hand, limiting prices for gene therapies, and on the other hand, providing incentives for what you call like truly innovative products. And I think you used that sentence that you used just now, Matthias, killing two birds with one stone. But I'm having a little trouble understanding the framework that you have in mind, because in my head, these gene therapies are very innovative. And so if you're thinking about lowering prices for these products, but at the same time providing incentives for truly innovative drugs, I see that as almost like pushing in two different, completely opposite directions. So I was hoping you could talk a little, speak more. Um, no, no, you're quite right. First of all, uh, when I was mentioning uh, the killing two birds with one stone, this was uh, 
focusing on this uh, study by uh, Fojo, uh, Lowe, and the like uh, on uh, on cancer therapy. So now uh, the looking at uh, rare diseases, uh, I think uh, the uh, so an, another another area. It looks like right now uh, we are. Uh, over incentivizing some of these uh, some of these therapies, uh, and as I say, having uh, fifty percent authorization for these kinds of things, uh, and we are talking about ten percent of six percent of the population, uh, and uh, already a big part of the drug budget. Uh, so eight percent of the drug budget for this. Uh, there is a question of uh, of uh, trying. Uh, limit a bit uh, the uh, what is going to happen here because I think we are overdoing it. So it's not the same problem as with uh, the issues that uh, Rachel and and Chris were, were talking about. And uh, and I think there uh, our feeling is indeed that uh, trying to uh, trying to benefit cooperation would be uh, could be a way to go. Uh, by uh, putting people around the table and making sure that we uh, we do things, uh, of course, without losses, huh? because uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, we we do uh, see the value of the private sector. The question is how uh, how greedy one uh, one should be. Thank you, Matthias. Maybe I take the last question because we are running out of time. And uh, if you can uh, say whether you have any any thoughts on this very quickly, I was wondering whether how you can imagine that advanced market commitment could eventually solve the international free riding problem when it's a question of innovating into a public good. There is always a problem of free riding. And uh, I, I'm not sure the market commitment that we have been discussing have uh, a solution to that. So I don't know. Um, I, I don't think it can solve it writ large because you still have the coordination problem. Um, you would still have to have countries coming together to both agree, uh, you know, to do so, to pay you know, equivalent prices or equivalent prices adjusting for local income. So I, I don't think advanced market commitments get you out of the free rider problem. Facilitate some limited collaboration. So for example, we have a paper out recently uh, looking at um, could the G7 as a grouping collectively finance new antibiotics through uh, sort of proportionate contributions to kind of a, a pull mechanism. Each of these would be sort of financed by the countries themselves. There's no binding nature to it, right? It would have to be just based on goodwill and contribution to the problem, but maybe as a sort of coordinated movement, this would be a way to get different countries paying it. I mean, I think we also did the math on it and it looks like it's very high return on investment. So it should be the kind of thing that everybody is willing to fund a uh, small part of, but you know, we'll see. It's a free rider problems, a hard one to solve. So we'll, fi we'll find out eventually. Thank you. Any concluding words, Chris or Matthias? Well, just that, you know, if we think about pandemic preparedness, um, the free rider problem is really, really hard to, to uh, or, or the prisoner's dilemma, excuse me, is a really hard problem to solve um, in, in a crisis. So, it, you know, we have a little bit more luxury now to try to coordinate. And, uh, I, you know, I totally agree with Rachel that none of these mechanisms are by themselves going to solve these problems, but it might provide a, a, a device or a forum um, to try to get a, a little further along on it. Thank you. Well, thank you all for this uh, interesting discussion. Matthias, do you want to say, add something? Well, no, I, I mean I, I agree with uh, with Rachel and Chris on the uh, uh, th thanks the a lot for problem. And sorry if you had to do it online. Uh, and we hope to see you in Toulouse another time. Uh, thank, thank you. you. Looking looking forward. Thank you very much for this great conference. So now we have a coffee break, I think, and then we start again at two thirty.